All right. Well, we're going to find ourselves in chapter 4. And I tell you, you know, it's such a small book. And, man, as, 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 as pastors, you, you really you don't want to dwell too long. But at the same time, there, there are so many things that you just don't want to skip over either. And this is God's truth. But, man, what an amazing display of the grace of God that not only was on Jonah's life and the Ninevites' life, but also the same grace that he extended to you if you know him as your Lord and Savior today. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, this is God's holy, infallible, inerrant, indestructible, eternal word. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before you unto Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and you relent of the evil that you pronounced or the destruction that you pronounced. Therefore, now, O Lord, take I, I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Or is it okay for you to be angry, Jonah? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Let's stop there and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's consider this. God is the John 3.16 God of the Bible. God is the John 3.16 God of the Bible. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. Lord, I just pray now that you would touch me, that, Lord, you would anoint me and do in me what I cannot do for myself. And Lord, I just truly pray that your word would go forth in power, that, Lord, you would fill me from the authority from on high, that you would fill me with your love and compassion. But that, Lord, your truth would truly go forth in power. That, Lord, you would use it to feed your people. You would water their souls. You would remind them that, Lord, you would use it to convict our hearts. Lord, use your word to draw us closer to you today. Lord, use your word to give us a greater appreciation for who you are and the grace that you truly extend to us on a daily basis, second by second, moment by moment. Lord, I just truly pray that if there's one or several here today that are lost, that do not know you as Lord and Savior, that, Lord, once again, you would remind them from your holy word. For all have sinned and fallen short of your glory, your holy standard, your commandments. And that the wages of sin is death and hell forever. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Lord, I just truly pray that you'll give them the faith to believe that you died in their place on Calvary's cross. I pray that you'll give them the faith to believe that, Lord, you truly deposited every single one of their sins into your son's body, as it tells us in Peter that you bore our sins in your body. And that, Lord, past, present, and future, all sins and every sin were placed on your son, and the wrath of God fell on Christ on Calvary's cross and died and was punished in our place so that we would not have to experience hell forever, but that we could have heaven as our home. Lord, give them the faith to believe that you died and were buried, and that, Lord, you'll give them the faith to believe that your son Jesus was raised from the dead by you. Lord, you tell us in Romans 10 that all those that truly call upon your name with a willingness to turn from sin and self, a full surrender of their heart to you, Lord, all those that call upon your name and confess you as Lord shall be saved. So, Father, we just pray today that there would be those that would be saved today and that, Lord, you would rescue their soul from hell. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we look at the book of Jonah, I want us to see the first point of chapter number four, and that's Jonah's agitation with God's salvation. Jonah's agitation with God's salvation. Look at verse number one with me. Notice what it says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, why is he angry? Well, look at verse number two. The Bible says that he prayed unto the Lord. Now, I'm going to call this a prayer because God does. But really, humanly speaking, it's more of a complaint. Jonah is complaining to the Lord about who the Lord is. Have you ever had anyone complain about you and just tell you all about yourself? Well, but listen to what his complaint truly is. It says, and he prayed unto the Lord, and it says, and I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before you unto Tarshish. Now you remember that Tarshish was located in Spain 2,000 miles away from where Jonah is. 
God told him to go to Nineveh, which was 500 miles to the east. But Jonah went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he got aboard that ship, trying to get far away from the Lord as he possibly could with the assignment that God gave him. And then it says, Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great <laughs> kindness, and repents thee of the evil. Now, Jonah had God's word. They had the first five books of the Bible. And then he probably read stories of Moses where God was going to wipe out the whole nation of Israel for being guilty of idolatry, but yet Moses interceded and God spared the whole nation of Israel and Noah as well. Amen? So I'm sure that he understood and he read all the different acts of God's mercy and how God relented at what he said he was going to do because it's not the heart of God to destroy people or to hurt people, but the Bible says that Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved, delivered from the wrath of God against sins that were committed against him. Amen? Amen. So our God truly is a gracious God. So he's agitated at the Lord for being a John 3.16 God of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, I tell you, we read that at football games. We quote that scripture. It's probably one of the first scriptures that kids learn. But boy, I tell you what, man, what a mouthful. It, it's sad when scripture becomes commonplace in our hearts. It's sad when we begin to listen to the word of God as just one more sermon, just one more service I've got to go to and attend. When we don't come with an expectant heart, we don't come to church really truly believing that, hey, this truly is God's word, and God's grace is an operation in my life every single day. You know, have you ever been taken for granted? Raise your hand if you've ever been taken for granted. How does it make you feel? Boy, it doesn't make you feel good, does it? But I can, I can honestly admit to you, as the preacher that is standing here before you today, that I have taken and I do take God's grace for granted sometimes in my life. And boy, I like what Charles Spurgeon said about the grace of God. He said, to sin against the Lord is intolerable. And we can see that because when you sin against the Lord, you're sinning against one who is infinite, who is holy, who is righteous. And because we sin against one who is infinite, holy, and righteous, the punishment for that crime is hell forever. If I go to the store and steal a penny or a million dollars, it doesn't matter the amount but if I steal something from the store, I go to jail. There is punishment for sin. Amen? Well, God being holy has to punish sin. And praise God, he took all of my sin, your sin, the world's sin. He placed it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wrath of God fell on Christ so that it would not have to fall on us. And he gives to us his amazing grace. But Spurgeon said this, to sin against God's law is intolerable. But to sin against his grace is abominable. It's one thing not to know something and do something wrong, but it's altogether different when you know something is wrong and you willfully do it anyway. That is taking the grace of God for granted. Amen? Amen. And Jonah is upset with the Lord. You see, in this book, Jonah is seen running from God, and at the very end of the book, we see him arguing with God. Let's make it very clear. Jonah is not the hero in this story at all. In fact, he was one of the worst missionaries there ever was. He wanted to see the destruction of the people that God sent him to to save. Amen? Guys, what, what a testimony that Jonah had. Here's a man that didn't want to preach for God to the Ninevites. Why? Because the Assyrians were wicked people. They truly were. They were despicable. They did abominable things. They tortured people. So yes, their crimes absolutely were deserving, and they were certainly deserving of going to hell, every one of them, just like you and I are also deserving of going to hell. When you look at sin through God's eyes, through God's perspective, you know, it's amazing to me when people get upset, they say, well, you know, uh, well, it was just a couple of lies I told. It's not that big a deal. Isn't it interesting how we always are soft on our own sin? But that same person, if you were to lie to them, boy, they would take offense to that, would they not? Boy, they would take great offense to that. If you mistreated their family in any certain same form or fashion, they would take great offense to that. But they themselves can mistreat people, and yet it's not that big a deal. You see, you have to see your sin through God's eyes 
and not through your own or other people's and how they evaluate sin. Because one sin makes you a candidate for hell. Do you realize that? I've used this before, but I'm going to use it again. If God's commandments were a chain, and each one of His commandments were a link on that chain, you're holding on to the last link, thou shalt not covet, before you is a 3,000 foot fall. So if the chain breaks, you're going to fall to your death. How many links of the chain does it take for you to fall? All it takes is one link on that chain. doesn't matter which one it is to break for you to fall. <laughs> God's commandments are perfect. And God says, if you sin against me one time, you sin in every part of the law. doesn't matter if you lied or you never committed murder. You never did this or that. But man, the Bible says to look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart to commit adultery already. So God says to us, listen, on Judgment Day, if you stand before Him, unwashed, uncleansed in the blood of Christ, if all you ever did was sin three times in your life, let's say you lied, you looked at a woman to lust after her, and you also uh, uh, were disobedient to your parents, or you love something more than you love God, you become guilty of idolatry, God's going to look at you and say, then you're a lying, thieving, adulterer who has been disobedient to everything that I've said. Does that sound like a good person to you? No, it doesn't. That's exactly how God is going to see somebody on Judgment Day. If they just sin one time and that's all they were ever guilty of, God's going to look at that person who was unrepentant, unwashed in the blood of Christ, who never surrendered their heart and life, never turned from sin, never gave their heart to Christ. God's going to look at that person. Let's say they were just guilty of one lie. You're a liar. How many times has someone got a lie before you call them a liar? One time. God's going to say you're a liar. Does that sound like a good person to you? Would a liar be somebody that you would hire for your business or you would want to babysit your kids? No. Absolutely not. But we're all guilty of lying. And if you say that you've never lied, then you're lying. Amen? Amen. Boy. And the Bible says in Job that when, when babies are born, they, then they go for speaking lies. You don't have to teach a kid how to lie. Amen? You need to teach them how to tell the truth because of our sinful nature. So he's agitated. He's angry at the fact that Jonah is is mad because God is a gracious God. So we see that Jonah's hot. Boy, he's mad. Most people get glad when one soul is saved, let alone thousands of souls saved. But Jonah didn't get glad. Jonah is mad at the fact that God saved these people who were deserving of his wrath. But Jonah's forgotten something. Jonah has forgotten the fact that he also was deserving of the same wrath of God that was also upon the Assyrians. Sometimes we can forget where we come from. Sometimes we can take the grace of God for granted. Sometimes we hang around people who we never hear cuss or we see do the right things all the time and we forget that we live in a sin-filled, sin-soaked world that is in desperate need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And sometimes we can get too hot and we can get too high up for our own good. Man, the greatest joy besides getting saved yourself is leading other people to the Lord Jesus Christ. In salvation, amen? You see, Jonah, though, he had the attitude that a lot of the Israelites had. Lord, it's okay to have compassion on me. It's okay to forgive me when I mess up royally. Lord, it's okay to save me from the great fish's belly. Lord, it's okay to deliver me when I'm in trouble or when I'm in a pinch. Lord, it's okay to forgive me and to love me and to hear me 24-7-365 when I come to you. Lord, that's okay. But it's not okay for you to have that same grace and mercy for anybody else, especially those that are our enemies. In this case, it was the Assyrians. You see, Israel had the attitude, it's okay to love us, but not the Jebusites, not the Ninevites, not the Hittites, or any other ite that the Bible says. Why? Because they had a wrong view of themselves, a very high view of self, and a very low view of the God that they actually worshipped. Amen? You know, John Newton was born back in the 1700s, 13 days before his 17th birthday, his mother had passed away. It broke his heart, but he says in his biography that his mom was the one that really, truly taught him uh, the scripture and what the grace of God meant and who the Lord was. But he was never converted, never got saved. Well, afterwards, he went to work for his dad, who was the captain of the ship. And through time, he became his own captain. And if you know the story of John Newton, he was a captain of a slave ship. In fact, he had one time where he actually made it to Charleston, uh, 
South Carolina, and he dropped and delivered off a whole boat full of slaves. His own crew said that he was so wretched and so wicked they regarded him almost as less than an animal. One time, he fell overboard in a drunken stupor, and rather than letting down a lifeboat to lift him back up on the boat, his own crew took a harpoon and tried to kill him, but the harpoon ended up hitting him in the hip, and they yanked him up out of the water with a harpoon stuck in his leg. And from that day forward, he limped every day of his life. And he used to say, that's a reminder to me of my old life and what sin really did to my life. That he was drunken, he was, uh, he was flogged, he was whipped, he was shipwrecked. I mean, God had nothing but grace on this man. And according to his own testimony, he was on an island. He was struck with fever. And there at that moment, he truly gave up himself and said, Lord, I cast all of me to all of you. Or I completely surrender all of me to all of you, and I'm accepting you truly as my Lord and Savior. Well, two years later, he was married to his childhood sweetheart, and then he studied for ministry for 14 years, and at the age of 39, he became a pastor. He wrote over 219 hymns or poems. One of those poems we know today that we sing it a lot. It's sung at football games. It's sung at church. It's sung in many places across this world. But that song was amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. Amen? Now what an awesome testimony to the grace of God. There's a man named Yancey, and I like what he says. He says, the problem... Is not with grace itself, but it's the nature of grace that human beings have a problem with. Now, you wouldn't think that a human being would have a problem with God being gracious. But we see here before us that Jonah has a major problem with God's grace, with God's mercy. You see, we all have a certain skepticism in us when it comes to grace. Now, the greatest definition I've ever heard of grace is this. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. You see, when somebody calls you like a telemarketer and says, Hey, man, I just want you to know that you are entitled to a free cruise or a free vacation. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? What's the catch, man? Amen? Man, what in the world's going on here, man? Somebody's trying to rip me off because typically it's the recipient of that vacation that actually pays for it. Amen? Yes, indeed. So we are all been taught that there's no free lunch. Amen? That's in our human DNA. That's our default. Man, there's no such thing as free lunch. But you see, grace shocks us in what it offers because it's truly not of this world. God's grace is something that you need to just ponder and pause and truly think about for you to really truly begin to appreciate the grace and the mercy that God has extended to you and that God extends to this world. What do you mean? Because listen, God's grace teaches us that God does for others what you and I would never do for them. Amen? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't give up my son for a pervert. I wouldn't give up my son for a murderer or a prostitute. I wouldn't give up my son for a, a, a child molester or a serial killer. Would you allow your son to die in the place and take the punishment that that serial killer deserved? Would you say, hey, listen, I want him to go free, but you can go ahead and, and take my son and execute him in his place. Would you do that? No. Nope. You see, God's grace teaches us that God does for people, does for you, what other people won't. Amen? Amen? Boy. You see, if it was you and I, we would say the not so bad. But you see, God starts with a prostitute. There was a woman named Iris Blue. She was a uh, madam. She ran a, a brothel. Here in modern times, she ran a brothel. Well, the grace of God was presented to her through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she understood that I'm saved by grace through faith. Not of myself, it's the gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. So she truly understood that. And the grace of God moved in her life, convicted her of her sin. And this is her testimony. She said, literally, I knelt down as a tramp. But because of the grace and the mercy of God extended to me, I stood up a lady. Amen? Amen? That's the grace of God. It takes a wretch and turns that wretch into a, a beautiful Christian woman. One who lived in darkness. One who uh, propagated that which God hates. And yet God's mercy and grace covered all of her sin. Just like it covered mine. Amen? 
Boy, you see, we would say they're not so bad, but God's grace saves those that do not deserve it at all. And that was you and I. Amen? Amen. So you come to the conclusion, God is much more gracious than I will ever be. Amen? Amen. I know that because, especially when I was lost, if I were God, there were certain people I wouldn't save. Man, I would just zap right off, right off, right off the planet. Amen. Especially when I was driving down the road and somebody cut me off. Man, I would zap the fire out of them. Amen. Well, He blesses people that I wouldn't bless. Man, if I were God, then there would be people that I wouldn't use in service that God Himself uses. Which brings me to the conclusion: I am so glad that I'm not God. Amen. And I'm glad that you're not God either. Because we'd all be in trouble, would we not? It reminds me of those people that are looking for perfection. It's an old one, but a good one. You know, I'm looking for the perfect church. Well, brother, well, sister, I've got good news for you. Or bad news for you. Whatever church you decide to go to, the minute that you step through the door, that church is no longer perfect. Amen? Because there's no such thing as perfect people in the world. Man, the compassionate. The gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You see, the doctrine of grace may be the hardest doctrine in the Bible to accept. You see, it's not hard to understand grace. No, it's not hard to understand it. We know what the word means, but the problem comes when grace needs to be applied to the human heart. What do you mean, Brother Dave? Listen, there's two things that God, grace, needs and wants for you to accept. But the human heart wants to resist the grace of God. The human heart doesn't want to accept the grace of God. It goes back to that telemarketer. Now, what's the catch? There's got to be a catch. You see, the two things that God, grace, wants you to accept that most people don't is this. Number one, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. I can prove that to you. Look at how many different religions there are in the world. Every religion in the world has their hand and something that they personally have to do in order to make themselves good enough, righteous enough, to be able to be accepted into the heaven that they believe in. Or even those that are more mainstream. There's something that they have to do. There's something that they've got to do in order to be accepted by God to get into heaven. The Bible says you're saved by grace through faith. That means trusting in what God's Word says. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works. Now, we've all heard this before, but when you have a gift, a, a true gift is not something that you pay for. It's not something that you work for. It's not something that you do or you're deserving of. A gift to you is a gift from somebody else's heart, and all you can do in order for it to remain a gift is to receive it graciously. Amen? God offers you that free gift of eternal life. That true ter eternal forgiveness where Jesus Christ went to the cross, took your sin, past, present, and future, from the day you died, or from the day you were born to the day you died, He being God, knowing everything you would ever do against Him in thought, in deed, in action, intent, and motive, all of your sins were hot-wired and downloaded into the body of the person of Christ on Calvary's cross. God's wrath and anger fell on Christ. He was forsook on the cross so that you and I can experience is eternal forgiveness. Amen? And because He punished every single sin, God remains a just judge. But at the same time, because sin was all punished, He is freely able to give you His love, grace, and mercy, and the eternal forgiveness He desires for you and the world to have. Amen? But number two, here's the second thing that God's grace wants people to accept that a lot don't. If God doesn't save us, we'll never be saved. You need to believe that. That salvation for you, for, in order for you to go to heaven, you have to be just as righteous as God is. You have to be just as perfect as God is. Man, human nature wants to buck against that. But it's the truth. And Peter said, what can, what can, what can men do to be saved? And Jesus said, with men, salvation is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? God, in the person of Jesus Christ, did what we could not do, and He lived a perfect life. He satisfied the law of the Lord perfectly. And the grace that's given to us is this. Jesus took your sin on Calvary's cross, and in exchange, because He loves you and cares for you, He imputes or downloads into your life's account 
His perfect righteousness. He took our sin and in exchange to you as a free gift, He credits you with His perfect righteousness and He wraps that around you by the Holy Spirit and you permanently have now been made the righteousness of God. That is how you get into heaven. Amen? Amen. But you see, man wants to get in there and say, well, no, you got you to gotta believe and repent, but you also got to be baptized with it. Or you got to be... Uh, you got to go into a booth and confess your sins. You got to do this. You got to do that. Let me ask you a question. Do you clean yourself up before you get in the shower? Or do you get in the shower to be clean? Hey Amen. You can't clean yourself up. You can't. God says, listen, you're guilty of sin. You're condemned. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Nothing. I like what Spurgeon said. He says, God will never clothe or give a man his righteousness until he first strips that man of his self-righteousness by the law. You need to understand God says you're a sinner and that you're guilty of sinning against him. And the wages of that sin is death and hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It didn't say through the church. It doesn't say through Jesus Christ plus baptism, Jesus Christ plus church membership or anything else. No, it's Jesus Christ Period. Amen. Putting all of your trust in His finished work on Calvary's cross for you. Are you with me? And what's interesting is the worst missionary in all the world, Jonah, who had a hard heart, who had hate in his heart for the very people he was preaching to, said in Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, listen, salvation is of the Lord. Boy, I tell you what, man, that's coming from the worst missionary there ever was because his heart wasn't right with God, but yet God blessed his own word, not the prophet. Amen? God's word is untainted no matter who it comes from. His word is pure, his word is holy, and his word is truth. Listen, John is not the hero. Man, mark that down. Even though he preached and did what God said outwardly, but he was still disobedient on the inside. And what's amazing about this book is, you remember in chapter 2, we entitled that the God of Second Chances. And the first thing that I said was that God was always in hot pursuit. First of all, he's always in hot pursuit of sinners. We see that because he told Jonah to go to Nineveh. But he's also in hot pursuit of his saints. You see, in chapter 3, we see the Lord's heart for the whole world. He wanted the Ninevites to be saved. Those murderous people to be saved, to be forgiven. But now here in chapter 4, he narrows it down and says, Now listen, I'm not only concerned about the nations of the world, but I'm also personally concerned about you. And he is working on Jonah's heart. And he's going to teach Jonah what compassion is. He's going to teach Jonah that he too also was a sinner in need of the same grace and mercy that God extends to everybody. Amen? You see, people have a problem with God could truly save Adolf Hitler if Adolf Hitler would have really truly repented of his sin and turned to the Lord Jesus and asked Christ to forgive him. Some people have a problem with that. Not Adolf Hitler. Not the man who's guilty of murdering 12 million people who treated the Jewish people despicably to the point where it goes beyond words how horrible that was. Wow. God could forgive? Even Adolf Hitler? Yes, he could. Well, how do you know, Brother Dave? Because Paul himself said, I am the chief of sinners. So if Paul is the chief of sinners, if God can save the chief of all sinners, then he can save you and me. Amen? Amen. You see, we can't out, out sin God's grace in the capacity that God has for grace. Isn't that amazing? That you can't out, out sin the grace of God. God's grace swallows up all of your sin and the world's sin. How do I know? 1 John 1, 7 says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Right. Amen? Amen? You see, the fish is not the star of this book because he's mentioned four times. The city of Nineveh is mentioned nine times. Jonah's name is mentioned 18 times. But God is mentioned 39 times in the book of Jonah. Because it's not about Jonah, it's about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Boy. You see, Nineveh. I've already asked this question, but you've got to realize that God is using Nineveh to display His grace. God is using Nineveh as that teachable moment. God is using Nineveh to teach us how truly gracious and merciful God is towards us. What do you mean, Brother Dave? Hey, Nineveh today 
is whatever pulls you out of your comfort zone. That's the Nineveh that you face. Amen? Nineveh is that place that you don't want to go. Nineveh is the people who have hurt you deeply. And God tells you to go to those same people and give them a message that I love them and am willing to forgive them just like you need to. <clears throat> Why? Because I've forgiven you of all your sin if you're a Christian. Amen? Now, I don't want to get up here and say that forgiveness is easy. I don't want to get up here and make light of the hurt and some of the horrible, despicable things that people have done to people because there is a lot of true, deep-seated hurt in people's lives. Amen? But my friend, listen to me. God's grace is much greater than your hurt. Amen? God's testimony of love and grace to forgive people is much greater than your personal problem. You see, God wants you to be a living trophy of His grace. That's why Paul said, Man, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. I've heard people say, when they hear my testimony, how wild and crazy I was and how I lived a life of debauchery and womanizing and all the other despicable things that were out there, they say, man, really, I wish I had a testimony like you. And I'm like, no, you don't. Because I still deal with a lot of garbage and baggage because of my past. A lot of scars, amen? Even though they're healed and I'm forgiven, God still gives you a memory, amen? you got to deal with that. I would rather have be one that said, you know what? Man, I got saved when I was five years old in church. And God kept me from all that sin and all that junk the world has to offer. I would rather have that testimony. Amen? Amen. Boy. Nineveh is dangerous. Nineveh is that place of discomfort. Nineveh is whatever you hate that God loves deeply. What do you say when you go to Nineveh? But boy, you got an attitude towards those people. What do you say? What do you do? Because sooner or later, God's going to tell you to go to Nineveh. Yeah. You have to deal with your Nineveh. And the way that you deal with Nineveh is by going to Calvary's cross and stopping and pondering and exploring the wounds of Christ and saying, Lord, you died for my sin. You personally took all my sins, all my hate, all my disgust, all the things wrong with me. And all the violations I committed against you, first and foremost. And I truly was a candidate for hell. And Lord, you saved me. You saved a wretch like me. And when you begin to understand the grace and the mercy that he's extended to you personally, and he's given you eternal life, he gave you a gift that you didn't deserve, that you received. That's where you can begin to say, God, now, Lord, I need you in me and through me to operate on my heart so that I can also extend that same grace and mercy to these people who have hurt me or to these people that don't deserve your grace just like I don't deserve it. Amen? Hmm. People don't like the fact that God is John 3, 16, God of the Bible. It blows my mind. Some people would love for the Bible to say, for God so loved the white world, for God so loved just the black world, or the red world, or the yellow world, but my Bible says, for God so loved the whole world. Amen? Boy. Acts chapter 10, verse 36 and, or 34 and 35 says this, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, because Peter was prejudiced against Gentiles. I would never eat inside a Gentile's house. Remember that? That great sheep came down with all those unclean animals and he said, Lord, I've never put anything in my mouth that's unclean. And then he was told, don't call any un anything unclean that God has declared himself to be clean. Amen? And he was using that as a reference to the fact that Peter had prejudice in his heart against people and the Lord was trying to teach Peter, listen, I love them equally as much as I love you. Amen? Yeah. And this is what Peter said, because he received the grace of God, he learned from the grace of God, and he extended the grace of God when he said this, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with God. Wow. Hmm. So Jonah was a man who was agitated and angry. At the grace of God. People get angry at God because they don't, they say, well, God didn't do what I wanted them to do. My mom was dying of cancer. And do you not think for a second that I didn't pray, Lord, heal my mom of her cancer? 
forget my mom and extend her life and give me more years with my precious mom? Do you think I didn't pray that? I did. But God healed her in a way that wasn't my way. Why? Because God's ways are higher than my ways. and His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And sometimes those are hard to accept. But nevertheless, as one man said, when you can't see God's hand, you can always trust his heart. Why? Because you've got to go back to Calvary. And you've got to go back and say, Lord, who am I? Lord, I remember the deep, dark pit that you pulled me out of. Lord, I remember the deep, dark dungeon that I was in. I remember the sin that was so wrapped around me and my soul was so sin so yet you still had mercy and grace on my heart and on my soul. You gotta go to Calvary. You gotta go to ground zero. If you're gonna ever truly love people the way God does, or at least start to love people the way God does, you've got to go to Calvary. You've got to have that personal relationship with Christ because it's Christ in me that loves people that I can't love myself. Amen? Hmm. Every eye bowed, every eye closed. Are you angry with God? God took my mom home to heaven. And God whispered to my heart and said, Dave, you prayed for healing, and now your mom's totally healed. Totally healed. Amen. Do I miss her? Yes. But do I blame God? No. Why? Because my mom was a sinner just like me. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I have the hope, the true hope, the solid hope of seeing my mom and my family once again, because he was saved. Are you saved today? Do you know for a fact that your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life? The Bible says, And all those that were not found written in the Book of Life were cast alive into the lake of fire. This is the second death, when your soul is eternally separated from God for all eternity. And yet the Bible says, I will in no wise cast out anyone that comes to me, <coughs> Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm able to save to the uttermost. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. Jesus said that if you'll truly repent of your sin, turn from sin and self, and ask Christ to forgive you, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, calling upon his name, with the willingness to turn from sin and self, the Bible says, all those that call upon his name in truth shall be saved. Eternity is too long for you to be wrong. God's given us an open book that you can know for a fact that you're saved and have eternal life today. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, These things I have written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. These things being the whole book of 1 John. Do you know for a fact right now that if you were to die, that you would truly go to heaven and that you would have Jesus as your Lord and Savior for all eternity. That's his greatest desire for you, is to truly know him and to be saved. If God's revealed to you today that you're not saved and that you need to be saved, I invite you to pray this with me. Now this prayer in and of itself does not save you. Jesus Christ is the one who saves you. This is not a magic formula, but God's looking at your heart. And if you mean business with God, he means business with you. And his desire is to see you saved and forgiven, the Lord will step into your heart and life and He will change your heart. He'll set you free from the habit of sin, the love of sin, and the overwhelming desire to sin. He'll change everything about your heart and life. If any man be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. So if you're lost and want to be saved, pray this with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. And Lord Jesus, I'm turning to you. And I'm putting my trust in your finished work of Calvary, where you paid in full for all of my sins, past, present, and future. And Lord, I believe that you shed your blood, that I might have eternal forgiveness of my sins. I believe that you died. And I believe that you were buried. And I believe <coughs> that God himself Raise you from the dead. And Lord, I'm telling you, I'm sorry for all my sins and my crimes against you. And I'm willing right now to turn from sin and self. And I'm surrendering all of me to all of you. 
And I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me. With no one looking around, if you prayed to receive Christ in a real way today, I just simply want you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Anybody else? Say, Brother Dave, that was me. I prayed today to receive Christ and his forgiveness that he wants to give to me. All right, church, let me ask you this. As the piano begins to softly play and we're preparing to sing our hymn of invitation, let me ask you this. Have you forgotten the grace of God in your life? When's the last time you've been back to Calvary and truly explored all the wounds of Christ and his beating and that crown of thorns being pounded down on his head and had his beard ripped out and he was spit on and <coughs> he was flogged and beaten with rods. And the Bible says that he was marred more than any man. He was literally, according to that book in the Hebrews, he was beat beyond recognition as a man paying the penalty for our sin. Well, when's the last time you truly went to Calvary and said, God, thank you for your love. Thank you so much, Lord, for saving me. Lord, once again, please give me a proper perspective of who I really am. And, or don't let me ever forget where you found me and what state I was in. Lord, help me to appreciate all the more your grace and not take it for granted. And when's the last time you prayed for souls to be saved? Did you come to this service today saying, Lord, I pray with all my heart that souls will be saved today. Lord, I just pray that you would touch that preacher, whoever is going to be in this pulpit. And Lord, I just truly am coming in this place today to hear a word from you to my heart today. Not just another sermon. Not coming here to critique the church. But you came here because your focus was truly on wanting to hear a word from Christ to your heart today. Whatever God's laid on your heart to do, I want you to come today as we stand. As you stand to your feet, I want you to come and say, Lord, I need you to do in me and through me what I can't do for myself, but Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it is that you're telling me to do. I'll be here to pray with you. I have other people that will come and pray with you if you need to help. Maybe some of you have been thinking about joining the church and God's laid on your heart that this is the day that you need to do that and that you want to use the gifts that God's given you to Help this body grow. We've been praying for God to send people to our church that would truly help get plugged in and get busy for his kingdom. But whatever God's laid on your heart today, I want you to come. Come, come right now. As we stand to our feet, come. What hymn of invitation? 275. 275. We're going to just sing one stanza. Come.